Grace, mercy, peace and love be to you from God our Father, our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit our Comforter and Guide. For our meditation today we'll be reflecting on that uh, first reading for today from 1 Samuel chapter 3. Uh, the full reading for today assigned for today is actually chapter 3 verses 1 through to 20 although there is the option of that shorter reading but these words where the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not um, widespread. Now the Lord came and stood there calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant is listening. Let us pray. Lord our God and loving Father, as you bring us together in worship this day and as we reflect on that encounter that Samuel had with you so long ago, a word that ultimately changed the direction of your people Israel in so many radical ways. We thank you, loving Father, that you also speak your word to us and that you bring change to our lives too, that we may hear the voice of Jesus and follow him. And so we pray, loving Father, as we now meditate on your word, that your Holy Spirit be at work within us, that indeed we hear you speaking to us. So we pray, sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. A story is told uh, that a long time ago in a uh, Morse code uh, company, a telegraph company rather, uh, that they wanted Morse code operators uh, and so they put an ad in the paper and of course this is as you know for um, Morse code that was in the era before the telephone um, so we're talking a completely different era and they discovered that um, if you send a little signal through an electric wire and cut it and stop it you'll get a sound that will come through and of course with those little dots and dashes you could send messages to people at a great distance instantly and you, you can imagine how radical uh, the invention of the telegraph and Morse code would have been in terms of instant communication and long distances. Now think about it, how radical that would be. And they needed, of course, um, Morse code operators, a highly skilled job. And so a telegraph company put an ad in the paper uh, and the people assembled in the room. And while they were there, there was the little beep of the Morse code in the background and everybody was sitting and waiting and a large group assembled but then a young man entered in the room and he was listening and then he got up and he filled in some forms and then he walked into the office and then he came out and the manager says right you've got the job now the others in the room complained they said well how come he gets the job we've been sitting here and waiting quietly and he said well you know that Morse code that's been operating in the background it says complete the form come into the office and the job is yours this is the first person who came in who heard the message listened to it and did what it says so the job is his there is a difference of course and i've spoken about it before between hearing and listening uh, parents can tell stories teachers can tell stories Bosses can tell stories, police can tell stories, lots of people can tell stories about how they have spoken to others and it seems like the other person wasn't listening to them. Told you to clean your room. And they said, when? And of course, the mind isn't tuned in. There's a difference between hearing and listening. And of course, there is a process where we a call to receive a sound, we have to understand it, remember it, evaluate it and respond to it as well. And uh, this is sometimes called active listening as well. And when it comes to listening, of course, we listen in different situations for different purposes. You might be listening to receive information and it doesn't require you to think about things but you're taking information in. You might be doing some critical thinking. Uh, you know, you're listening to a, a, a lecture and you're trying to work out, well, how does this relate to me? 
appreciative listening. It's like when you're listening to music or you're, you're watching a movie and you're listening to the words. You're appreciating what is happening. And of course, empathetic listening, which is where you're really listening for the other person. You know, sometimes people will uh, listen to respond, but others will listen to understand. And there is a difference between those two as well. Listening to respond and listening to understand. And sometimes we believe we're listening to understand the other person's point of view, but it's interesting how often a person after that will say, they never really listened to me. And it happens in many different settings, in all of those various settings I spoke about before. Listening to understand. And of course, in a Christian environment where God calls us to care for one another, listening to understand. Do you truly understand me? Now, of course, there's a great little one in a uh, Peanuts classic cartoon here, Charles Schultz, and I love this one, Charlie uh, and Lucy. Uh, Lucy says, so what do you think? And Charlie responds, what difference does it make? You never listen anyway. Lucy, I was just trying to make conversation. Charlie responds, when you make conversation, you have to listen too. And Lucy responds, you do. Do you have to listen? Now, of course, I'm using this uh, for an illustration in terms of our scripture reading for today from 1 Samuel chapter 3. And this is a reading that is, you know, we could speak on for hours and hours and hours. It's loaded with irony. It's loaded with all sorts of deeper realities within simple words and simple phrases, and it's important to understand it. Uh, that, and it's also a reading that occurs in a very, very important time in Israel's history. You know, if you go to the Bible and you look at uh, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, and First and Second Kings, depending on how you do it, either five or seven, that should sound significant, seven. Those books cover essentially a thousand years of Israel's history. That's a lot of time, isn't it? And when you read through these particular books, you find that it doesn't give us history like you would normally receive in a classroom today. You know, there was this, there was this, there was this. It certainly does that, but it does by way of story and anecdote. And so when we come to this word today of Samuel, who's very significant in the history of Israel, and the reason Samuel is significant is that he is essentially the last of the judges. Now in the Bible, a judge, in that book of Judges, they were the people who were raised up to be a central figure in the life of the nation of Israel. So there were the, all the tribes in their various areas, but a judge would bring people together around a common purpose. Now, if there was an enemy invading, or if the men usually it was the enemy invading because the people had failed to obey God's command. And so Samuel stands as the last of the judges of Israel because after him, there are the kings. So Samuel is really important. He anoints the first king of Israel, Saul, and the second king of Israel, David. And of course, he dies before Saul has died as well too. In 1 Samuel 25 uh, is where the account of that. And it's just a little sentence hidden away at the beginning of that, leading up to the death of Samuel. And so the books of Samuel have to do with the kingship of Saul and of David. And it's in the book of Kings that we end up with Solomon and the various kings that follow. And so there is a backstory here which is really important. And what's important also here, and remember how I said there's a thousand years of history. If you get your Bibles and you look at 1 Samuel chapter 1, it is the account of how Hannah the second wife of Elkanah, Hannah, whose name means favoured or gracious or graced, Hannah hasn't got a son. And the first wife has sons, has children for Elkanah. 
Hananiah has children. And Hannah goes to uh, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, and it's currently at Shiloh. It's not in Jerusalem. Remember, it's David who brings the temple to Jerusalem. And she goes and prays to God. A whole chapter of the Bible, remember, a thousand years, one chapter is devoted to Hannah's prayer. The next chapter, by the way, is devoted to um, Hannah's song, as well as the account of where Eli was up to in relation to listening to God. And we hear the boy Samuel, the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. This little phrase is a word of criticism of God's people in that time. The word of the Lord was rare. In other words, they weren't listening to God. See, at this point, um, you know, for us, when we pick up the Bible, we see it as a complete book. But at this point, the people of God had essentially five books in the Bible. Some debate that, but five. Moses, when they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, leading up into uh, entering the Promised Land, we have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. What is that saying? The people weren't listening to God's word. Eli was not a devotee of the word in the sense that perhaps God required. And prior to Samuel getting this word, a prophet had been sent to Eli saying, look, your sons, they're taking the sacrifice and they're abusing the sacrifice for their own material gain. Indeed, they're having sex with the women who served at the temple, they're at the tabernacle. And God had brought his word of judgment to Eli, but things hadn't changed. And so Samuel was being called by God, this, uh, this small boy. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. And it would be easy for us, of course, to draw parallels to the world in which we live today. Although I would contend that in every generation of humanity and Christendom, people would have this criticism. The word of the Lord was rare because people aren't listening to God. Now, of course, we know that account of what happened, that Samuel was lying down in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark was located and the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And it's a little hint, it's a spiritual hint, that phrase, the lamp had not yet gone out. In other words, God's light was still shining there for people but it wasn't shining very brightly. Not that God wasn't shining brightly, but the people weren't attending or listening to him. And then the Lord called Samuel. And of course, Samuel's name means, I hear God. And, of, and it, it, there's a fascinating phrase. Now, Samuel had not yet experienced the Lord because the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. That's a phrase that's hinting that perhaps Eli had failed in his duty as a priest in reading, actually reading God's word to Samuel himself. He was attending to all of the religious duties, but neglect, neglected the most important of all, actually getting to know God's word. And then, of course, after that word came to him, not once, but twice, Eli uh, understood that something important was happening here. And Eli said to Samuel, go lie down and if he calls you, you shall say, speak Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, an interesting phrase, isn't it? He stood there calling as before, Samuel and Samuel, and Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. And if you continue reading through in, in that chapter, then you see that God speaks a word of judgment again on Eli as well. And of course, from this point, Samuel goes out and is seen as the one who is listening to God. 
I think it's in the X Files. Uh, there's an episode where um, apparently, and I'm not exactly sure how it goes, but um, Dana Scully, you know, there's uh, Fox Mulder, he's the one that's going around trying to find all these strange things, and she's a bit of a skeptic. But there's some sort of conversation about, does God speak to the world? And she responds, well, you know, perhaps God is speaking and we are not listening. God's word hasn't been in short supply even before Moses. It's always been here in the world, but perhaps people aren't always listening to him. You and I are called to listen to God. We are called to say, speak, for your servant is listening. But how do you listen for God? And it requires a number of things to be at work in our lives. At a very practical level, if you're going to listen for God's word, you have to hear God's word. The hearing comes before the listening. Hearing is, you know, you can hear the noise, but listening is for understanding. So you have to hear in order to listen. And you know, in our catechism, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Luther explains that we are to fear and love God, that we do not despise his word or neglect the preaching of it, but regard it as holy and gladly hear and learn it. And practically what that means is you gather together in a faith community like this and you hear the word spoken. But as you hear that word spoken, you can reflect on the effect it's had on people's lives all around you are different people who've had different experiences of the word of God and how God has been at work in their life. So we listen to God's word in the community of faith. But in our homes and in our families, the catechism reminds us when you wake up in the morning, you pray, in the evening when you pray, and then it has a, a pattern for a devotion. And very importantly, is opening up the scriptures, reading it, and for us in our tradition, we have those little devotion books, don't we? And people reflect on what it means for them in their journey of life. This is about hearing for understanding. And they give us a point of reflection. But listening to God is more than hearing a sound. Because it has to do with our heart. It's about where we are in our journey of life in terms of our walk with the Lord. And as we listen to those other two scripture readings from today, you know, from 1 Corinthians about the way we are to use our bodies, it's about a lifestyle, a way of living, our whole lives being devoted to God. But as we come to the gospel for today, where Jesus says, follow me, he is calling for our hearts to follow him. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And what this means in the depths of our hearts is hearing that good news God has for us. You know, in our theology, we speak about a theology of the cross and a theology of glory. And it's sometimes misunderstood, this phrase, a theology of the cross. A theology of glory says... And it's like the Pharisee and the tax collector, Jesus' parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee stands up the front and says, look, God, look at all the wonderful things that I am doing for you. The theology of glory. Look, God, these great things we've built. Look at these institutions we've established. Look at all the good things we're doing. Surely I'm doing a good for you, thing for you, God. Surely I deserve your grace and favour. Look how wonderful I am. That's a theology of glory. The theology of the cross, the tax collector stood at a distance and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. When Jesus calls us to follow him, yes, he's calling us to a holy life. What the Pharisee was doing was right. His attitude was wrong in that parable. It's about the heart. When Jesus says, follow me, he wants all of us to know that deep down, we are loved by God no matter what. 
The psalm for today says, you have searched me and you know me. Even before a thought is in my mind, you know it completely, Lord. We have our ups. We have our downs. And when Jesus is calling us to listen to him, to follow him, his journey is to a cross to bring about a radical change in this world. We called to listen to God. And it is to a particular lifestyle, a particular calling. We have the Ten Commandments for a reason. But when we look at this, we see so many people and our hearts ache for them because we see the trials and troubles in their life. By the way, not only did Eli's son failed to follow the word of the Lord. So too did Samuel's as well, which is why the people said, give us a king so that we have an institution we can have as a reference point for what's right and wrong. And of course, Samuel is saying, well, you'll get this, but it won't always go the way you want because, of course, we're fallen, we're sinners, and we know that so many of those kings indeed did not walk in the way of the Lord. They didn't listen to his word. And what makes David, the king anointed by Samuel, the greatest king of Israel, is in those times of failure, great moral failure, he returned to the Lord. And that great psalm that we use for our prayer of confession for today it's a beautiful pattern and a reminder of someone who learnt to listen to God in the difficult times. God called you to listen to him. And listening to him involves those actions and activities such as attending worship, such as reading the word. But at the heart of it, it's not just hearing something. It's knowing that God speaks to our hearts. He speaks to your heart. Samuel says to the Lord, speak for your servant hears. Samuel urges God to speak. And God does because he has something for Samuel to hear. So also we listen because we have something to hear. We hear the voice of Jesus that brings God's saving truth and love into our lives. And as we reflect on the Holy Gospel for this day, let us praise God that even in those times when we have doubts about our own faith, Jesus promises to speak to, speak to us constantly with his grace and love through his word. God is speaking. He never stops speaking his word of love to you and those around you. And with Samuel, we know that he transforms people. So let us remember that simple word from God to you. I have called you by name. You are mine. What a wonderful thing it is to know that God speaks this word to us and over us that we receive the gift of forgiveness and eternal life through Christ our Saviour. Amen. And may the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. Amen.